guess for the people out there at TV land, this is the uh, first time in a long time that council is meeting all together. So for those people that they can't see this is social distancing, we do have in the room tonight with us Mr. Poole, Mr. Uh, Cole, Councillor Gray, Councillor White, and you can half see maybe, Councillor Morio, Councillor Friesen, and I see people in. So, welcome. The result of the agenda for the June 16, 2020 regular meeting of Council will be approved. Moved by Deputy Mayor Tony, seconded by Councillor Deloye. All in favor? Opposed? It's carried. Mr. Cole, is that loud enough for you? Yeah. <clears throat> Result of the minutes of the June 2nd, 2020 regular council meeting and June 9th, 2020 committee of the full meeting be received and approved. Moved by Deputy Mayor Tony, seconded by Council Friesen. Discussion? All in favor? Opposed? It's carried. Delegations tonight, 4.1, we have our CFO, Mr. Nina, and Pasco Harding Company, CPA, uh, Mr. Um, Hardy, um, uh, in reference to the 2019 Federal Gas and Tax Annual Expenditure Report. So, Mr. Hardy, I guess I'm going to start with you. Uh, starting with Terry, he's going to. Um read the financial part and then i will uh, do the audit report unless he's not quite available yet okay i'm here okay go okay ahead. i was hoping to share my screen but it's disabled well just one second then should be good now go ahead Okay, so uh, we st started off the year with an unspent uh, balance in the federal gas tax fund of 253000 We received 430000 from the province. That's double what they normally give. They gave a one-time doubling in 2019. Uh, earned $8,000 of interest. And the only expenditure was 35000 under the category of local roads, and that was all sidewalks. So there's an unspent fund balance at the end of the year of 657000 And the, the column to the right is the cumulative. So since the program came into effect, uh, the town has received $2.9 million from the province, earned $65,000 in interest. Spent 620,000 on local roads, 467,000 on drinking water, 981,000 on wastewater, 211,000 on solid waste, and 31,000 on disaster mitigation. So that's yeah, that's all I had to present. If there, unless there are any questions. Any questions to Mr. Gadina? Okay, thank you, Mr. Hardy. All right, so then uh, I'm here to uh, just review the independent auditor's report. Um, we audited the uh, the uh, statement that, uh, that Mr. Ganita just reviewed with you, the annual expenditure report, including the cumulative totals. And uh, this auditor's report is a little bit different, a little bit shorter, more like the old versions that you used to see. So it's a little bit different than what you've been seeing when, uh, when we present the full financial statements of the town of Swan River or um, some of the entities that uh, that are consolidated into that. So just to review, uh, it starts out uh, saying that we are independent auditors, that we have audited the town of Swan River's compliance. So this is a compliance uh, audit report. So we're auditing the town of Swan River's compliance uh, with the criteria established by the terms and conditions of the municipal gas tax agreement. So it came into effect back in 2014 between the province and the town of Swan River. So management being um, uh, Mr. Ganita and his uh, finance staff um, uh, is responsible for the compliance with the criteria that has been established by those provisions and to maintain such internal control as management determines is necessary to ensure compliance. Our responsibility in the next paragraph as auditors is to express an opinion 
on this compliance based on our audit. So we conduct our audit still in accordance with Canadian generally accepted auditing standards uh, that require that we plan and perform the audit um, to obtain reasonable assurance that whether the town of Swan River has complied with those criteria. And such an audit includes we examine on a test basis certain evidence that supports compliance. Uh, and the next uh, paragraph says that we believe that as a result of the audit evidence that we have obtained, um, that that audit, audit evidence is sufficient and appropriate for us to provide a basis for our opinion. And the last paragraph is that in our opinion, this expenditure report presents fairly in all material respects the funding and expenditures for the year ended December 31st, 2019 in compliance with that municipal gas tax agreement. So it's a clear audit opinion. There's no reservations or qualifications. Does anybody have any questions on that? Any questions? Any questions? And once again, it is a draft report uh, uh, until it's approved this evening. And uh, upon a pr uh, approval, uh, then I will uh, sign off on the audit report. Okay. Doesn't look like there's any questions there for you. So thank you very much uh, for your presentation. And thank you very much to Council for uh, accommodating the uh, uh, me being first on the agenda this evening. I appreciate that very much. No problem. Thank you. All right. If you want to have a great around, evening. If you want to hang around and watch for a little while, that's up to you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I'll be signing off now. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. Have a great evening and a great meeting. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Okay, so moving on <clears throat> to uh, 4.2, another delegation with Ms. Uh, Karina Medwood. Uh, she is here to discuss uh, waste management. Uh, she's with us tonight via Zoom. Um, Hi. We'll just get your picture up there. Oh, I have to have a picture? What do you want? Okay, it doesn't matter. That's fine. If you want to. <laughs> What, I'm however, good. Just however you're comfortable. Anonymous. Whatever you're comfortable with, that's fine. <laughs> so I'm good being anonymous. Okay, then we'll we'll we'll. This is fine. We can hear you perfectly good. So um, oh, you have sent uh, your letter to council. So council's had a chance to read that letter, and so I guess if you can, instead of going and reading it all over because council has had a chance to read it, maybe if you can kind of tackle it. Um, some of the points and maybe some of the questions that you had um, some of those questions may not be able to be answered tonight but our administration definitely if they can't answer tonight will uh, get an answer for you in the next uh, few days so because of our agenda we do have other things to deal with tonight so you, we usually limit to 10 or 15 minutes so go ahead okay I am gonna kind of read through it just because I did tweak it a little bit since I sent it to you and then that way I know I cover what I want to cover for sure. Okay, so I'm just gonna skip right to the start of garbage collection and recycling. Um, I see the validity in contracting out these services in respect to the town and taxpayers no longer being on the hook for purchasing, maintaining, and or repairing equipment required for the service. But has anyone actually looked into what our carbon footprint for these services are, especially when we're putting the service out of the local area and service by outside of the valley. So currently we contract our recycling to OSS. So my understanding is the trucks are coming from either Yorkton or Dauphin, which is about two hours away. So if we're using two trucks for residential recycling services with a four hour commute and two days a week, that's an additional 16 hours of commuting time and carbon footprint, which does not include or account for the 68 hours per day spent collecting the recycling. So I guess one thing is, is I only put my bin out about once every six to eight weeks because it takes me that long to fill it. So are the bins we're collecting every two weeks, are they actually full for most of the people? Or is this something that we can maybe reduce our service in to also reduce the carbon footprint of providing the service? So if we're staying with automated service and considering the size of the bins provided, um, they do actually fit quite a bit. And when we look at automated garbage collection, and I know 
that's not happening right away. But if you're still kind of having that in the back burner, the black bins for garbage are the same size as the recycling bins and they can hold about double of what the town currently permits for garbage collection. Because my understanding is the current limit is about two large black garbage bags or two standard sized garbage cans. And those black bins can fit a lot more. So then the question is, not only are we generating more of a carbon footprint if we outsource this and we're having trucks commuting two hours uh, for collection, but we're also putting more potentially into our local landfill unless they're carting it away with them. So that then raises a concern of our landfill lifespan as well as the space and whether we can accommodate that. Um, does our town even generate enough recycling to offset the carbon footprint of the 16 plus additional hours of collection trucks commuting to provide a bi-weekly service? Uh, the other concern I have with recycling is in the big picture, it's not picking it up from our doorstep isn't the final step. It still has to get processed, separated, bailed, chipped, transported possibly one or more times before it meets the final destination of being processed into reusable material. And I realize that's not on us financially. However, it does contribute to the overall carbon footprint required to actually recycle. So if China has closed their doors to accepting recycling, and to my knowledge, Canada itself does not have a market or processing facilities that actually turn the recycled items into reusable materials, then what is the overall carbon footprint to get these items from our doorstep to a facility that makes that happen? And is it worth it from an environmental standpoint? Uh, with regards to... Um, the landfill, I kind of already covered that with, if we move to an automated service, we're potentially putting more waste in there. If we go the route of outsourcing garbage collection, what happens to our local town staff who currently collect garbage? Do they end up getting laid off? And if not, then are their wages and salaries being tacked on to that number crunching for determining the true cost of outsourcing the service? Because if those employees are transferred to another job position that is not vacant at the time, then their wages and salaries would become an additional burden on the taxpayers. And that would be directly caused by and related to the service being tendered out. And if they're transferred to new positions that are vacant but have a lower pay scale, are their wages then frozen or do they receive a pay reduction as per that job's pay scale? So those are all scenarios, in my opinion, that would need to be factored into any overall calculations to determine true costs of moving to outsourcing the service, be it now or in the future. What is our town and council currently doing in terms of encouraging and enforcing waste, waste reduction? So I commented here about the PAW bypass, uh, passing a bylaw in 2016 to ban single-use plastic bag. Organic waste, I've read that food and yard waste can be up to 50% of the waste collected. Uh, while living in Calgary, they actually um, pushed and subsidized compost bins for residential use. Uh, you could purchase them from the town for about 20 to 25 bucks. They have now moved to a mandatory green bin composting, which they factor into the city's green plan using the compost uh, to maintain parks, green spaces, reducing and eliminating the need and cost for chemical fertilizers and soils. So has the town considered implementing a composting program, be it compost bins provided to residents, which I'm sure the town could source a reasonable wholesale price for a bulk purchase that would reduce the cost to ratepayers, and or designating a section of the landfill to organic waste. I believe this would actually require a change in the way waste is currently collected and received both at the landfill and from the residents. Uh, maybe we even have a local company that can source and repurpose some old food barrels into rolling compost bins and rain barrels. Rain barrels would be helpful in helping to enforce any um, watering of lawns and yards gardens through the summer, which would reduce the burden on our town water services and resources, which I believe is also a bit of a concern for us. Uh, implementing a maximum garbage and waste limit with fees for additional bags for waste. This would work best in conjunction with an active recycling and or compost program 
and basing the waste maximum on the maximum use of recycling or composting programs. Countries like Switzerland have been operating this way for decades and their garbage bags are basically sized based on the amount allotted. So your recycling bags are actually larger than your garbage bags and there is actually a fine. If you exceed the limit you're allowed and or misuse a bag, you actually do get fined and billed for them. So has the town considered implementing a similar system for reducing of waste? And if we have an effective compost and recycling program in place, we should be able to reduce the frequency of garbage collection. If the town supports a residential compost program that would reduce the need to provide regular pickup for organic waste and the seasonal pickups currently offered could be used for larger items such as branches and excess waste during spring and fall cleanups and added to the organic waste section in the landfill to either be used by the town to maintain green spaces and parks or to generate some revenue by selling it to the public. Which gets me thinking, does our town and council currently have a plan or working on a plan for reducing our overall waste and carbon footprint with respect to waste management? And is it being factored into our strategic plan? And is it being considered when tendering for services? Operating a reusable section within the landfills for appliances, furniture, housewares, etc., or partnering with the local thrift stores, appliance repair businesses, and nonprofit organizations to repurpose as much reusable items as possible to keep them from actually taking up space in the landfills and prolonging the lifespan of the landfill. Operating the reusable section of the landfill with a pay what you can for items would also be a way to generate some potential revenue towards operating expenses and help out our at need, low income and youth populations or just those who personally prefer to reuse or upcycle versus buying brand new. Use of an incinerator. I have heard that at one time there was some talk between, I think it was LP in the town about possibly getting one, that there were grants and government funding available to help cover the costs. I briefly Googled the use of incinerators for use in waste management and by no means consider myself an expert, but I did discover they come with a longer list of pros than they do cons. However, that very short list of cons does include significant points such as cost, both for the unit as well as the trained and experienced staff to operate it and pollution was another. But I do suspect with the model that includes the filters to catch pollutants capable of handling proper disposal of clinical waste, you'd reduce the risk of pollution during the incineration process, leaving proper handling and disposal of the ashes to deal with. What really caught my attention to this method was the reduc reduction of land space required to store the waste. It can reduce the mass waste up to 90 to 95%. The reduced risk of chemical pollutants seeping into the ground and contaminating soil and or water sources during the compost process that traditional landfills use. They have less odor, noise, pests and methane gas as compared to traditional landfills. They operate in any weather which could be beneficial for our long cold winters. Effective for metal recycling, it can easily be separated from the ash. Eliminate harmful germs and chemicals, including clinical waste, which brings to mind an aspect of our current social epidemic with needles. And what really piqued my interest was their ability to produce heat and power. Europe and Japan have integrated incinerators into modern heating systems. Sweden generates approximately 8% of its heating needs from waste incinerators, which gets me thinking, is this something we can use to heat or power the wellness center or any other government run building and offset some, some or all of the utility costs, thereby reducing the burden on taxpayers. It also makes me think this could be a possible solution to the box cardboard that our businesses are currently having issues with disposing of since that market appears to have tanked and no one wants it. Which then gets me thinking, would local access to an incinerator be useful or beneficial to other businesses in the industry area? If after grants and government funding there is still a cost, then maybe it's time for the municipalities and town to take a global approach to a common waste management problem and partner together. Collaborating with businesses and industries, one could offer an investment incentive similar to what a charitable organizations do when funding with a bronze, silver, gold or platinum investment option, with each level offering X amount of free use of incinerator for waste based on volume or time in months and years or a combination of the two before regular service fees commence for that business industry or municipality. The other thing to consider is if, the val if there was valley wide support for moving to incinerators is operating one specifically for organic waste only. So the ashes produced could in turn be used by farmers for their fields, would reduce the amount of chemical containers needing to be recycled or disposed of, 
of, of and any potential source of revenue off, to offset the cost of operation. The organic only incinerator could also be used by farmers in the summer in lieu of applying for burn permits when burning off organic waste. With our extremely dry ground environment and lack of trees to block winds, there is always a risk of fire getting out of control. Operating a separate incinerator capable of properly disposing of clinical waste should also minimize toxic pollution from disposing of agricultural and industry chemical waste. Economic impact of outsourcing services requires tendering follow NWPTA obligations, and I've spoken before, I don't fully agree with this, as it can have a detrimental impact on our local economy. Yes, it is de designed to get the lowest price for the same quality of goods and service, but at what cost to the local economy? External companies do not pay local business taxes. Their workers likely don't live in the area and therefore not paying property taxes or spending their paychecks at the local food, retail, or gas stations. The smaller local businesses that lost the bid would have contributed to the tax base, supporting other local businesses, and most of all, it may make the difference between that business con continuing to exist. If they go out of business or stop providing that service, what is to stop the external company from jacking up their rates, especially if they know there is no local competition? Now we potentially end up contributing to the population decline with increase in external service contracts and people moving away to find gainful employment. In my opinion, we, meaning our town and councils, need to be advocating for small town municipal governments to either have different thresholds or maybe a window or margin of discretion that allows for us to factor in overall impact to our local economy for the duration of the service contract. In regards to tenders for waste management, is it possible for our council to tender with consideration to carbon footprint? Would that violate the, the existing NWPTA agreement? And does our town or council need to establish policy or bylaws pertaining to carbon footprint or environmental limits or thresholds prior to factoring that into their tendering process? In closing, I grew up both in the city and on grandpa's farm. In the city, everything went in the garbage and we had no limits to my knowledge. On the farm, we burned garbage, so burnable items went in the household. Garbage table scraps were fed to the barn cats and dogs. Potato peels and vegetable scraps were tossed amongst the fruit trees. We had a garbage can for glass and one for metal that eventually got hauled to the dump. Nothing was, or everything was handed down. Clothing, material, used for rags or making quilts. People back then still canned most of their own food, reducing the amount of canned food purchased or used. And there was very little waste on the farm. And I recall even at a young age thinking every fall when we returned to the city, how wasteful urban environments were. Cities like Brandon, Winnipeg and Calgary have brought in recycling and some have also adopted composting into their service to deal with the re and reduce the amount of waste going into the landfills. Our society as a whole has become extremely wasteful. I believe it is time for our town and councils to be encouraging and enforcing more waste reduction and reuse in our community. If our waste management services put more emphasis on reduction through composting, banning of single use plastic bags or other nuisance type items, offering access to secondhand or pay what you can reusable items and recycling, that should significantly decrease the amount of actual garbage collected and therefore possibly reduce the frequency of service required and prolong the lifespan of our landfills that's, and that spiffy new garbage truck we got. I'm all for getting the best bang for our buck, but to what expense on our local economy and our environment? We need to find a balance. I don't have a concrete solution to offer, but the three R's I learned about in school for waste management were reduce, reuse, and recycle, managed in that order. It was my way of life on the farm, and it's still my personal practice wherever I live. So the bottom line, I guess, is does the town incorporate or enforce any means of reducing and or reusing waste in the current waste management service plan? And if not, I do hope I have provided enough ideas and possibilities to provoke deeper thought, research, and consideration into how our valley is managing its waste and reducing our overall impact on the environment. Okay, <clears throat> that's quite thorough. There's lots of things to consider there. I, I have about 10 points written down. I'm sure that Mr. Poole was also writing down <clears throat> what your questions were. And I don't, I don't know what wants to be answered tonight, but definitely they can respond to some of them. But I guess I'll open up to council if they want to ask you any questions. Councilor White. Forgive my ignorance, but how do you measure carbon footprint? What is a good footprint and what is a bad footprint? 
That, I don't have a concrete answer for you, but I certainly think it's something we need to look into, especially with regards to both the federal and provincial government starting to crack down on things like that with our, our carbon taxes and whatnot. Okay, thank you. And that's a good point. The province and the federal government do have some new regulations that are coming. Anybody else? Councilor Morio. Um, thank you for your uh, letter there, Karina. Um, just to go over like a few things, a lot of the things that uh, you've mentioned there and discussed there tonight, uh, the Public Works Department and the committee is already in discussions um, on some of those topics, like uh, the frequency of uh, recycling pickup. Now that uh, we're getting accurate data on what recycling amounts are actually being picked up and stuff like that. So we are actively right now engaged in a study um, to see if we can actually go to once every three weeks or once a month, like you suggest, to reduce the costs and things like that. Um, along with the, the other things, uh, along with the uh, recycle or not the recycling, the compost pile, um, there are provincial regulations on what requirements are on that. So those are actually being investigated at this point to see if that's something that is feasible going forward because um, that is one thing on our radar is compost um, as, as I know personally coming from uh, an area that did do it uh, household compost waste uh, can dramatically reduce the amount of household waste um, if you compost so um, but like I said there's a lot of uh, regulations it's not just a, a pile of compost that out the back 40 and you flip it every once in a while there's a lot more to it than just that so um, but I'm sure uh, administration will look at your letter and have written down points and they can get back to you with uh, some more formal answers and concrete um, on what that is but uh, a lot of the stuff you uh, have highlighted we are actually in discussions uh, with them and in analyzing some of those uh, things at this point so thank you very much okay thank you Councillor Gray, did you have a question? Or a um, no. Comments? Okay, go ahead, comments. Uh, Mr. Reed, thank you for your, I know you can't see me, but thank you for your presentation. It was, um, as the mayor has already described, complete. Um, and I may be missing the point, but the specifics aren't what really concern me. It, it seems to me, Mr. Mayor, that what Ms. McBeat is asking is do we have plans or have we thought about the bigger issues? And I'm going to make some suggestions. Um, one is that um, not talking about the specifics of whether we should do any of the individual topics, but the bigger concept of how we deal with waste and in particular um, things like recycling uh, may be appropriate for us to discuss at a meeting of whole meeting, not as I said, whether or not we use a particular contractor, not whether we go to one particular model or another, but sort of the bigger issues, and um, I'm going to come back to that in a moment. The second is the issue of carbon footprint, which I know we haven't discussed in any meaningful way, and I think we should discuss that at a, as part of our strategic planning process in some way, um, whether we do it before or after we complete that. Uh, lastly, I think these are issues that are going to need to be discussed on a community level at some point where we engage everybody. And so I'm going to, the reason I mentioned that I'm going to come back to the first point, one of the questions is whether or not recycling in its current model is even a viable thing to do. But the reality is we spend more on recycling than we do on carbon collection. And whether or not, it's not that we should waste, and no one thinks we should waste, and no one doesn't think we should recycle. But is there, in fact, value in doing it? And shouldn't we as a community decide if that's something that has actual value, um, as opposed to just doing it because esoterically we think that there's a, right, a, a reasonable basis to do it? It doesn't mean we shouldn't. I, I'm not at all saying we shouldn't. Before anybody gets out there and says, David Gray's against recycling, I'm not. But I, I think that we haven't had a bigger discussion. We, we just sort of fell into the pattern of doing it the way everybody else did and said yes we should do that but now is the time we should start thinking about bigger issues and saying is this valuable because one of the things and that's where the comparison comes between the costs of those things and things like we like a carbon footprint and his remarks are well 
think in particular in us not looking at a larger picture, we have done, I think, a pretty good job of analyzing what the individual costs are and going through individual decision making. But that isn't really what council's job is, certainly that's the administration's job. And so I think, Mr. Mayor, if I might, I'm going to suggest that we put those on future committee of the whole topics and that we engage sometime in the fall the entirety of the community in a discussion. Maybe they won't want to have the discussion, but it, we should give them the opportunity and then we should move forward with a broader uh, plan from council. Okay. Thank you. No, thank you. And that's great. And, and I think you're right. <clears throat> um, I'm definitely looking at what recycling means to the community. You said before the cost of it, we know that it costs us more money than what garbage pickup is. So definitely it's something that we want to do, but is there a different way we can do it or, or save money or whatever the, the whole vision of, of uh, recycling and reducing waste in a landfill? <clears throat> Anybody else? Councilor Wintoni? Ms. Medwood, I just want to thank you for providing your information and uh, your delegation tonight, and I appreciate um, your uh, feedback and your information that you have provided to Council, and I appreciate that from the community at large, and uh, I just want to obviously extend my appreciation for you having taken time out of your busy schedule to provide thoughts and, and information to us, and I assure you that Council, that we will look into those issues and uh, look at the b bigger, broader picture of it. So I just want to say thank you. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. All right. So uh, I guess with that, we thank you very much for bringing it in tonight and bringing those points forward. Uh, I, we all appreciate it. And, and anybody in the community that brings uh, these things and other issues forward from their own uh, view is very important and uh, is taken, uh, it's not taken lightly. We, we do appreciate community involvement and suggestions. So we thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate what I am actually hearing for the comments and feedback there. Um, my biggest thing is, again, to get people thinking. So if you I'm looking forward to what answers you can provide me, but if they're going to be like, this is something we're going to look further into, I'm happy to hear that too. It's, as Mr. Gray said, I'm kind of more interested in the whole global perspective of it. And I'm not against recycling either, but again, if it's costing more and it's just ending up in somebody else's backyard not getting processed or biodegrading or whatever, is it really worth it or should we be focusing more on reducing the waste we actually create? So thank you very much. Good. Thank you. Have a good evening. You as well. Thank you. Okay, so we're moving on to 6, <clears throat> 6.1. Result of the building permits 3420 through 3620 with a total estimated value of $39,720 being received. Moved by Councillor Gray, seconded by Councillor Morio. Discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Councillor Gray, did you have a question there? No. Okay. <clears throat> 6.2 Result of the letter dated June the 12th, 2020, from the Deputy Minister of Municipal Relations regarding federal gas tax. Fund 2020 and 21 accelerated payments it be received as information. Moved by Councillor Morio, second by Councillor White. Discussion? All in favor? Opposed? It's carried. I, I take it when we get to our later point in the agenda where we approve that, that will be the requirement in the letter for reporting before the end of June. That's the only thing we have left with that. I take it that, that when we approve the draft financial statements and audit and send that that will be the last reporting requirement that's referred to in the letter so that we're at that point fully compliant for this? Yes. Yeah. yes. I just wanted to make sure that that was the case. I assumed it was, but I... It's carried. Yeah. <clears throat> 6.3. Resolve that the letter received from a, from a port in the storm be received as information moved by... Uh, Deputy Mayor Wintoni, seconded by Councillor Delorier. Discussion? Councillor Gray? Um, I don't know. I, I wasn't 
here when this was done. I was in Thompson, but I know that a number of municipalities contributed to that and a number of businesses. And if they're winding up operations, uh, I'm just wondering, if it's nice of them to tell us, I'm just wondering what they're planning on doing with the surplus. They were a registered charity and I think they have certain obligations, but I, I think it would be appropriate for us to ask what is it that you're doing because I, I don't know I, I don't know if this municipality did contribute. I know that Thompson did it. I know a number of organizations in Thompson did it. It was particularly um, useful for people from Thompson <coughs> And so uh, it just would strike me as something that would be useful for us to know is assuming we did contribute. If we didn't contribute, that I think it looks tacky for us to ask what do you do with your surplus. But but assuming we contributed we didn't contribute all I don't think we contributed. Mr. Ganita can confirm that. Mr. Ganita, did we contribute to this uh, project? Not that I recall, no. Yeah, I didn't think we did. Oh, well, I'm, I'm not sure what you're saying. But it's, a, but, it, but it's a good question, definitely. They gave us a presentation, but I don't think they Oh, okay. Okay, so all in favor? <laughs> it's carried. Sorry. <clears throat> no, that's fine. It's you're not, you weren't here, so how do you know, right? <clears throat> Result of the Director of Public Works report be received as information. Moved by Councillor Gray, seconded by Councillor Friesen. Discussion? Questions? Councillor Morio. Uh, Mr. Poole, uh, I assume that uh, the Main Street uh, water sewer project is on schedule uh, for end of June. Um, starting for actual detours and construction? Yeah, next week we'll be saw cutting and kind of like, we won't be closing the, the road next week, but the week of the 29th, the residents can expect the detours to go on. Okay, and so we'll be proceeding with uh, advertisements and that in the newspaper on projected stages of detours and that so public are aware. Yeah, it's, you, you uh, said those to the start time, yeah. Perfect. Okay, thank you, and thanks for bringing that up, actually. Uh, just for information, I did speak with the MLA about maybe lobbying MIT to maybe for that pavement to be done more than in a five-year plan, so there's some discussion with that, so hopefully we can lobby to have that done next year, but they don't think it will be done this year. Councillor White. Uh, just, uh, if you would, uh, Mr. Poole, thank your team for putting up the uh, graduating post-year's pictures. Uh, it's, it's something that's resonating throughout our community and thank you to all the guys who made that happen and thank you obviously to the graduates congratulations to them and the team who made it happen which we're a part of yeah that's the school division deserves uh, a lot of credit there as well their idea they made the banners they came to us it was, uh, it was a lot of credit to over there absolutely great councillor gray um pretty well one of them we're going to cover under the other thing but the repair on 6th, um, the people there, um, as you know, I go every day virtually and speak to people, a number of them live right in that area, say that the repair still leaves a gap of a few inches. Is that true? I didn't go look at it. I, I saw it. Okay. I'm not acting on the spectrum, so I'm not going around sure checking. But I was raised with you, so I'm asking, is, there, is, there, is it complete? Is it smooth? And uh, no, I'm, I'm actually, to be honest, I haven't been there. I just told them it was complete last week but uh, they should have put uh, cold mixer on there to make some flat to the Here we go it look. Been done, it will be. thank you um, <laughs> the second is that in today's meeting uh, with AMM one of the things that was announced was uh, a significant number of uh, infrastructure things that they were talking about I, I think they were a little unclear on how that process is going to work I think that's a safe statement but I'm sure that in your meetings with control they've, they've dealt with that um, I, I'm, I'm just wondering, um, we're not planning on leaving that unpaved until next year so that I, so that uh, infrastructure manager would catch up with us, aren't we? Uh, you're, we're filling in those spots? Currently our asphalt pavement budget includes the paving of our trenches. We're paving over there. Yeah, we, we know it's going to settle MIT. We discussed that with MIT, but uh, yes, there will be paving. What, what I was referring to was the mill and, and fill that would need to be done eventually, which they have agreed that they would do what, in a five-year plan. So. I thought they were going to resurface it entirely. That, well, 
all we're doing is our trenches. Right. MIT would likely do a mill and fill just like they did on, on the other side. Uh, that's what we've been told is on their five-year plan. Well, it's working with our usual practice. Can we not organize it so it's done right at rodeo time? <laughs> That's why there's no rodeo. Right. <laughs> yeah. 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 Anything further? No. Councillor uh, Frieza. Um, the cemetery meeting, um, I would like to be included in that if I could be. Any further discussion besides that? Okay, all in favor? Opposed? It's carried. 721 resolved that the 2020 May 2020 Protective Services Report be received as information. Moved by Deputy Mayor and Tony, seconded by Councillor Gray. Discussion? Councillor White. I just see uh, one comment in there where we don't have a, a burning ban in our community yet. And it's relative to what happened in the next few days, of course. Uh, I'm led to believe we're, we're really dry, and I hope I'm comfortable our, our team is looking closely at that. A burning man in the community, I don't think, would hurt a lot of us. So it would be an uh, error on the side of safety from my perspective. I guess, uh, Chief Fedorchuk, I guess if you want to comment on that. Yeah, right, yes, sir. Yeah, uh, we're good without a burning ban. Uh, as of today, both uh, the municipalities of Mountain and Minnesota's Bonus have withdrawn their burning bans and are back to operations as normal. But we'll keep an eye on things, though, obviously. Thank you. Yeah, we always do. Okay, thank you. Okay, through the discussion. Okay, all in favor? Oh, Councillor Gray, you have no, no, I, I was going to be, uh, are we going to get, go back to getting reports from the RCMP at some point? I haven't seen one in some months. What was the last time we had one? Last council meeting, I think, there was a written report from them. So, weren't they going to go back to the old style instead of that thing that the division created? We like, can look, we can look I into thought it. Staff Sergeant Campbell said that he preferred that, and, and it certainly is much more complete and fulsome, in my view, than the. I don't know what, I don't know who designed it, but whoever designed the thing that they produced. I guess we did get it, and I don't remember, but I, I, I remember a few months, about a month and a half ago, I got <coughs> a more complete one yes. and, and answered some question, questions, and then answered some questions. And before, but I don't remember getting one for, I remember getting sort that, that I don't want to be harsh, but the, the report that the Envision created um, about April, and, and I don't remember getting one since, and I don't, and honestly, the, one we, the ones we've been getting for the last year were useless. And I think everybody commented on that at different points. Okay. I'll we'll look right. into that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Further discussion? All in favor? Opposed? It's carried. 722. Result of the May 2020 Swan River Handy Transit Ban Report be received as information. Moved by Councillor White. Uh, seconded by Councillor Morio. Discussion? All in favor? Opposed? It's carried. <coughs> Council reports. I'll start with Councillor Gray. Um, I went on, I, I apologize for meeting last meeting, the whole meeting I intended to, but I was in uh, Thompson and was required to be in uh, a hearing in Yorkton, well, it was actually on my telephone from here, but in Yorkton on the afternoon, so I was in transit during the time of the committee the whole meeting could not have met, so I apologize for that. I did meet yet on um, Monday, that was yesterday, I guess, with seven services. Um, everything is going really well there. They are on budget. They have actually some surpluses being projected and some plans for the surpluses. Um, numbers both here and in the fall are very positive. Um, we, I attended the AMM meeting today, and um, that's an hour and a half. I'm not getting back. Um, so w we should talk about, about the value of AMM and, and the way the meeting <coughs> uh, I apologize, Your Worship, for meeting, missing a, a meeting I had in my office, ran over, and I couldn't be, make the meeting um, for this afternoon uh, with the Minister of Justice. I'm sure somebody will report on it. 
Yeah. We had good the representation, so. Um, and those are the meetings I have. I have a number of issues, but I think I'll raise those in by way of uh, communication to you and, and request for uh, specific agenda items. All right, Councillor White. Uh, PMH meeting recently and uh, looking at phase three for COVID, which many of us are following, but I, I think it's important to acknowledge our community, specifically our business community, for all the uh, proactive things we're doing within their businesses, having people meet and greet you and uh, encourage you what not to do or to do. So uh, I think we're doing a good job as a community. Uh, medical service meeting on June the 10th. Uh, we looked at things, uh, possibilities, and still embryonic, and incentives for medical professionals, be they doctors, nurses, or physiotherapists. Looked at the process with the guidance of uh, your worship. It's a little uh, open at the moment, so we're trying to tighten that up. And at some risk, uh, we talked about the how to fund the potential CT scan for our community. And uh, one line struck me, uh, uh, Dr. Burnside was there, uh, Dr. Uh, two doctors, three nurses, whatever, and what Dr. Burnside said, I'm going to misquote him, no CT scan, no surgeon, no surgeon, no maternity processes. So the importance of the CT scan is uh, paramount for, for medical reasons and obviously for recruiting medical professionals we need also. Then this afternoon we had the community safety meeting, uh, me members from the Justice Department, we looked at the options and regarding hiring a community safety officer, what they could or could not do, and I found that really interesting. So it's certainly something on our radar, and we as a council are still working on that. Thank you. Councilor okay. Gloria. Um, last Monday had planning district meeting. Uh, only thing that I guess uh, concern not us and our municipality. We did first reading of the redesignation of the land uh, to the east of the Friendship Center there. Open recreation to industrial and to institutional. Yes. Right. So that, uh, and then we have the hearing for that beginning in July, maybe the 7th, but I might be wrong on that. So um, then uh, today we had the meeting with Justice and uh, I was really happy because it was been the first time that I've actually spoken to or been part of a meeting where somebody really seemed to concrete know what a community safety officer could do, couldn't do, what somebody who knew something. So I was very happy with that because at least now we can have a further conversation about it. So the you know I'm not saying that's where we're going to go or not, but but it's a real thing now in my mind. Not that it wasn't before, but nobody could really explain it really well to me. So I was very happy about that. And that's it for my reports. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> um, we had a planning district meeting, which Councillor Delorier um, filled us in on that. And then just a thank you and congratulations to the SVRSS grads and thank you to the town and all of our team for putting up those uh, those banners and and what a great way to salute those grads in a in a year of in a trying year. Uh, that is all I have for today. Okay, thank you, Councilor Morial. Uh, a couple of things. Uh, this morning, uh, attended the uh, AMM district meeting, which was significantly uh, different than uh, than what we're normally used to, as this was, was held by Zoom versus in person so it added a, a different twist to it uh, for it so um and then as other councilors reported this afternoon uh, we had a meeting with the justice department regarding some ongoing uh issues uh, regarding justice and some community uh programming here which uh, um on some of the topics like community mobilization uh, there was some very good fruitful discussion on that which was very enlightening uh, and we'll leave that at that until there's more work on there um, last Tuesday, community uh, hold we had, uh, which we participated on. Uh, just want to remind everybody if the <coughs> the open for consultation for phase three for COVID that potentially may start open up on June 21st, where there's some relaxation um, on some of the restrictions. So if you have any uh, suggestions on that or concerns, please take your opportunity to. Uh, engage that on the Manitoba website, which is, I believe, on Engage Manitoba. Um, 
for that, uh, but it definitely, uh, with the restrictions loosening, that would definitely help out some of our local businesses and economy on that. Um, also, just a reminder to let people know and to support our, our grad 2020 students here, uh, that there will be a grad parade on Friday, uh, June 19th at 6.15, starting on the normal Northwest uh, around the parade route um, and following there. So there will be some traffic uh, disruptions and directions at that point from 6.15 on. Um, so just be cognizant of that and spread the word as there may not be as large a crowds as what we normally experience during the rodeo. So uh, people may not be aware that there's an actual parade on, but there's a significant number of volunteers um, and organizations that are going to be helpful with traffic control and barricades um, with that. And I also would like to uh, shout out and say thank you to the Swan Valley Co-op for their legacy grants um, and announcing that they're going to donate $10,000 to the uh, Legion Park Canteen uh, project that uh, the, that organization that came to the uh, town office and requested we support them. So I understand they probably have some more requests out there, but uh, $10,000 goes uh, a long way to that uh, project to get a new canteen there, along with the two other projects that they are supporting here in the valley, which is the Benito um, Skating Rink, Sound Booth, and there was one other one, I can't remember it, but appreciation to the Swan Valley Co-op for um, their um, generous donations on that. Reinvesting in the community. Yes. Yeah. Is that everything? <coughs> okay, thank you. Councillor Friesen. I think it was Mary Thomas from the call. I attended the cow meeting on the 9th. Um, yesterday I went to a community care meeting. Um, they're busy with not a whole lot right now because of the COVID. They talked about uh, Spooktoberfest, which probably won't happen unless they figure out something that they can do outside. I mean, it's going to be October, so that's up in the air. I don't know what we're do anymore. I'd like to uh, pass on kudos to Lorianne Bernal, who's part of the Communities of Care. She uh, went to the coal south with uh, snacks and drinks for the teachers and they were very appreciative of her and that all came from communities of care. I had a chat with Amanda <coughs> back today in regards to the fireworks. Um, we're going to put something in the paper in regards to uh, the perimeter that has to be observed because these fireworks are going to be a lot bigger, a lot higher than our previous ones and there's only a certain area but you cannot go to the grandstand, and so I asked her to do the uh, picture. Our fire chief has given me a picture with the parameters on it that you cannot go in, so I don't know if we have to put up tape of some kind that says you can't go here. We also need the two ends of 13th. If you could maybe ask Mike to get his guys to drop off barricades, I'll look after putting them up. Not a problem. Okay. Maybe something the Canadian well, papers. Well, can, can, can our own people be doing that? Why would you be doing that? From the shop. Always got them up. Well, no, they don't work July 1st. Oh, yeah. And we're not going to need them until approximately 9 o'clock that night. I've always put them up, so it's not a big deal. Um, I also was at the Park Land June District meeting today. <clears throat> Enough said there. Um, um, yes, I would also like to wish the uh, sincere congratulations to the 2020 grads. I intend to go to the parade. Perfect. Thank you. Um, Councilor Gray had something. I, I just had um, three things. Uh, well, two things I forgot. One was. Um, I, I know I missed the committee of the whole meeting. I, I really only had one comment or question from that meeting because the minutes aren't very clear. How in hell did I come in charge of dandelions? 
when, when you miss when you miss a meeting, I mean, maybe, then you, you, you get put on a committee. What? When you miss a meeting, you're oh, put on a committee. Yeah, I, I, it just doesn't even make any sense to be on your recreation. I, unless you're just penalizing me for my yard. Um, you were, sir. It could be you, that's true. <laughs> Um, the second is we have a, a recreation committee, the whole meeting on uh, July 12th, I, I know. Um, that's problematic for me because I have to be in Creighton and Flim Flon that day, and since I'm chair of that committee, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if we shouldn't move it to a different date. I mean, I can try and get back, but it's four hours, yeah. and so I, I just don't want to have anybody upset at me. Well, do you, do you have another date that you can it, 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 recommend? Date. I don't care. You, you can pick a date. Like, literally in um, in the month of <laughs> July, I have one court date. It's in Flin Flon and Creighton. They, uh, they have them on the same date, which is going to be an interesting dynamic anyway. And it's that day. So you can literally pick any other day in July, and I'll be here. Well, it's your committee, so then why don't you just mention a date that works for you? Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll, uh, Charles and the road design is the best for, for management and, and for me. Fine. Okay, so the, the third thing that occurred to me as everybody was giving kudos to the grads, um, are we planning on giving the banners to the grads at some point? Like it seems to me that we might as well at some point take them down before they become tattered. Is that part of the plan? Uh, Derek could probably answer that. There's, there's a grad on each, or sorry, two grads per banner, so it would be tough. You have to Oh, pick one. Unless you can get a razor thin. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, when they came in, Darren and I discussed that, and it was because I'm sure every kid would like to have one of them, you know. But uh, oh, we sure. looked at it; it's going to be virtually impossible to split them. Yeah, they'd have to have a seamstress to tear apart all those stitches. I still think 50% of the grads getting the picture is worth it, rather than throwing them all away. They well, have to have to get them is wonderful. Flip a coin, whatever you pick names. Our, our plan is to return them to the school division, to possibly the parent committee, and they can decide. How, how much would it, like, I, I've seen, I, I've sort of seen them, but how close are the papers? There's very distant one, aren't they? One's on one side, one's on the other. Oh, uh, oh I see, yeah. I, that way. Uh, yeah, they stitched them together. <laughs> they stitch, like, there's two different, there's two, there's two stitched two, together? Yeah. So how much would it cost to separate them? It looked pretty difficult to do. We need to try it with an engineer. <laughs> I don't know. Can we? But, but it just seems to me that that look, this was an extraordinary year, and and I agree with Councillor White for the first time this fiscal year <laughs> that that in fact we we, that, no no we've been we've been together lots of conversations that 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 it just seems to be a waste not to give them to the to the to the individual. We'll, we'll try. Yeah, well, and if it's a huge amount, if it's more than a thousand dollars, then fair enough. But if it's a, a few hundred dollars, for me, that would be worth it. I, I think, quite candidly, we should talk about whether we should do this on an ongoing basis, whatever happens in the future. True. Councillor Fraser. Who did the pictures, Derek? Who, who made the pictures? Sign here. And, and Sign here. So maybe they could. You get this one, and you over here. Get a sign here. The school division owns the banners, so I, they'll have a pretty big hand on what's going to happen to them, and I'm sure they're going down that route, and we'll, we'll figure out a way. Yeah, okay, good. It's just, we've had nothing but incredibly positive comments. Well, absolutely. I, I think they were a fantastic idea. I think we should consider it on an ongoing basis. I think we should find a way of making sure kids get them on an ongoing basis. Perfect. Well, thank you. Um, for myself, <clears throat> Uh, it was mentioned that the um, that we struck a committee for the doctor recruitment fund, uh, basically to set up a process of what recruitment and the dollars and all that that were coming out of that fund because there had not been a, a really good process in place prior to this. There's dollars and contracts and all that kind of stuff, but exactly how it worked, it wasn't there. So we're going through that process right now, where the two uh, individuals that were hired from the uh, from the committee, they're working on that and we'll have something hopefully in, in the next month. <clears throat> um, a reminder that our G4 meeting on, go ahead, tell us your grade. No, no, no. Um, reminder that on G, uh, Monday is our G4 meeting uh, here in Swanerville. We're going to be hosting that. I don't know if we 
have some time in the next couple of days to talk about what we want to talk about. I had kind of like a, a, some things on the agenda that I think that Ms. Enkelman had put out there, but uh, and that had to do with the doctor recruitment fund with RISE. I think there's some discussion about maybe shared services. I don't know how in depth we're going to get there, but definitely we need to be all on the same page when we're uh, hosting that meeting. So I don't know if we can do a Thursday night, maybe for an hour or something like that, and, and have a discussion. Um, I'll just kind of put that up there. Tonight? Rise. This Thursday? Yeah. Oh, you're having a meeting on Rise. Okay. So then maybe after our meeting tonight, maybe we can take sure. maybe 20 minutes and we can hash that out. Okay. Um, I had a meeting with Chief Janai last Saturday. He wanted to talk about some land again. So uh, I had a good visit with him and uh, we'll be hearing more from uh, him and Sapatoya Cree Nation in, in the next little bit. Um, and again, today it was mentioned that we had our meeting with the uh, uh, Justice Department with Mr. Clark and Mr. Ferguson <clears throat> and the in-depth discussion about the community safety officers like Councillor Gloria said, we learned a lot more about that and they're going to be uh, sending some information to Mr. Kroll about what the details of that program is and uh, we'll have that hopefully in the next few days and then we'll be able to have a full in-depth discussion. Um, in one of our call meetings to uh, see if we're something that we're interested in. We talked about the community mobilization hubs and we do have one in Swan River. I think in that first meeting in March they, it was kind of like do we have one here but we do have one in, in Swan River and they're looking at actually possibly expanding those services so <clears throat> it's a it's a it's a that's a good thing for the people that are in need of that service. And then our community safety planning, that's something that the province is still working on with COVID. It kind of slowed it down a little bit, but uh, they're hoping that maybe in the, uh, in, probably in the fall time, that the province will have something uh, out there for us to see what that looks like. And basically what it is, is they, they have, we'll have a consultant that will work with our community on safety planning. Um, we talked a little bit of RCMP and, and, and how the costs are spread across the province and, and the provinces looking at that, um, how that's all kind of calculated right now because they did admit that it's kind of an old system and how it was set up and uh, they're hopefully in the next year we'll maybe see something like that might be um, suggested that they'll move towards so that was a good thing and he talked about grants and I <clears throat> suggested that maybe they would give us a little bit more money in, in granting towards our policing costs, but he, uh, he declined that pretty, pretty quickly. So, <clears throat> and then lastly, the banners of everybody's mentioned on Main Street with our grads of 2020, and it's, it's a really an outstanding uh, addition to the community for this, this summer, and, and I agree that it's hopefully maybe a tradition that could continue on. Um, we're, you know, uh, received so many messages and calls, people just saying that this is just a, such a great thing to do, and not only for people in the town of Swan River, this is for everybody in the whole valley. These are our valley graduates, and we're honoring them in, in, in Swan River, so it's, uh, it's a great thing, and, and like I said, hopefully maybe we can work out something, or the school division consider doing something like this on an ongoing basis. And then further to, to the banners, I believe that the Northwest Mady Council also will are working on some uh, additional banners. So we're going to be, if that all works out, we're going to have some a lot of banners and decked out uh, down Main Street and in our entrances for the summer. So that's it for me. So moving on, 7.4 resolves the town manager report for May to June 2020 be received as information moved by. Deputy Mayor and Tony, seconded by Councillor Morio. Questions or comments? Councillor Morio. Um, just looking at the, the report there, Mr. Kroll, um, I'm very intrigued with uh, your recommendation. And, uh, I think that's it's a very good thing that we need to actually take a, a strong stance on what services we're providing and what type of relationships we're going to have with our neighbors uh, so that there's not this. Uh, a la carte pick and choose, uh, pay what we want to pay versus that. Uh, we need to 
decide what we're providing and how we're going to provide it and what the costs are and take a strong stance on it and, and go from there. So I'm very intrigued with that recommendation. Okay. Anybody else? Mr. Crow, anything to add to that or comment? Uh, not really. Okay. I've taken holidays for two weeks, you know, a week or so. Okay. Uh, going to Ontario to see our new grandson who we haven't been able to see, so they're supposed to be lifting some of those restrictions so we'll be able to travel, so. Good. If, if they lift those restrictions, so. And, and, and that's good, taking a holiday, obviously, and the office will be covered off properly. Yes, there's, uh, we, we work on the, that four-member system of the leadership Yeah. So there's always one person from the leadership team. Perfect. Have all the time. Okay. Further discussion? All in favor? Opposed? It's carried. <clears throat> Eight, new business, 8.1. <clears throat> whereas Richard Dick George Walker was a resident of the town of Swan River, and whereas the town of Swan River has the opportunity to express its appreciation for the unique efforts and abilities of Dick Walker, not just a highly respected local philanthropist, but also a Swan Valley resident who truly exemplified what it takes to be a volunteer committed to supporting numerous initiatives, projects, and events throughout the Swan River Valley, who spent countless hours organizations such as Ducks Unlimited, the Rotary Club of Swan Valley, the Swan Valley, uh, Swan River Valley Agricultural Society, and more, and uh, in all, <clears throat> all its successful efforts that have made a difference for everyone living in and visiting our valley. Therefore, be resolved that Fifth Avenue West in Development Plan 34203 be legally renamed Walker Trail. Moved by Councillor White, seconded by Councillor Friesen. Discussion. All in favor? Opposed? It's carried. 8.2. Whereas Glenn McKenzie is a resident of the town of Swan River, and whereas the town of Swan River would like to acknowledge Glenn McKenzie for his tremendous contributions to the town of Swan River and the Swan River Valley, including over 30 years in municipal politics, serving seven years from 1988 to 95 as councillor, and 23 years from 1995 to 2018 as mayor. Glenn has been instrumental in the development of initiatives by heading council and serving on countless committees, including the G7, now the G5, doctor recruitment, multiple recreation initiatives, upgrade to utility infrastructure, medical recruitment fund, and the Health Foundation, to name a few. Therefore, be resolved that the Century Bay and Development Plan 34203 be legally renamed to Mackenzie Bay. Moved by. Councillor Morio, seconded by Councillor Delorier. Discussion? All in favor? Opposed? It's carried. <clears throat> 8.3. Resolved that the Town of Swan River be in support of a joint drainage project between the Town of Swan River, Municipality of Swan Valley West, and the Province of Manitoba. The drainage project shall start at the intersection of PR 275 and 2nd Avenue Northwest through the East Ditch along 2nd Avenue Northwest, ending at the Swan River. Moved by Councillor Morio, second by Councillor White. Discussion. Councillor Morio and the Councillor Delorier. Um, I think this is a great opportunity for our neighboring municipality to the partnership along at MIT on a, a cost appropriate uh, solution to the water drainage that needs to be addressed before they um, address any of the repairs and upgrades to Highway 275. Um, as in, outlined in the report, uh, <coughs> MIT has two other options that are probably very significantly uh, more expensive than what we're proposing here, which is an agreement by Swan Valley West and ourselves as the most appropriate uh, way to drain the water in that area. So um, I think it's a very great opportunity that uh, we work with them and solidify our efforts to convince uh, MIT that that's where the water should be drained versus their uh, proposals one and two um, for that um, to make that project go ahead so that they can upgrade uh, that road uh, to new standards and get it resurfaced for those residents there. Because uh, from what I understand that they're not willing to even entertain upgrading that road until the drainage issue is addressed. And quite frankly, the uh, 
proposals that they're putting forward um, ahead of that are to me they're in the multi millions of dollars that don't make sense. We're uh, looking at maps. Water hasn't gone there since the tracks have been put in. Um, so I think it, this is a a common sense. Uh, approach that's very cost effective to drain the water where it's been flowing <coughs> for decades and, and from what I can see in the research so uh, I think it's a, a good initiative and hopefully we can partner and work together to convince MIT that that's where it should go and then be partners in it because uh, we need to upgrade and address the drainage issue in that ditch anyway um, but uh, our requirements are significantly less if it was not the drainage for that um, that roadway. So, uh, if we can get them all on board, and then maybe co we can cost share that uh, project to a significant uh, standard where it meets everybody's needs, and not just our own. Or we just if we did it, it would be just uh, to our own standards. So. Okay, Mr. Poole, do you want to comment on that at all? Uh, yeah, as, as Councillor Morris said, uh, the most important, or I guess our needs are that we need to keep that. Uh, ditch there to drain our own properties. So uh, it's beneficial to us, us to have partners in, in the funding of that project. It's just the, the points that council needs to remember is, is that we we have to, to lay out the extents of that project so that we don't get into uh, into the bigger project. We, we try and keep it, it, it into our scope and, and that there is no guarantee that MIT will accept the current drainage uh, plan if we move forward on it. Uh, however strong they are in their opinion of, of what drainage needs to be done there is up to them. So the risk of that bears solely with the municipality of Swan Valley West because we still need to use that drain. Good point. Councilor. A few questions. Um, first of all, what's the timeline on this as far as it's obviously not going to be happening this year. This is there will probably be done some engineering done this year. Uh, or a water study and then, and then possibly next year we'll have to make sure we budget for this. Um, second question, who, I'm all, all in favor of working together with, with the municipality, who is quarterback in this so to speak, I guess, which municipality will be hiring the contractor or hiring the engineering firm um, and I guess we'll, we'll have to have an agreement in place prior to doing that. Um, to, to de determine how those costs are going to be distributed because as it was pointed out by Councilor Morio, their needs are a lot greater in this than ours. We still have some need for this, but depending on which route, route they go, their needs are going to be considerably greater. Um, my third question is uh, how, how, uh, how are we going to be paying for, for, or I guess what's our plan for paying for? Are we doing a local improvement on the affected properties? or? or uh, we hadn't, hadn't got to that point yet? Uh, well, to answer the first question, the, in process, the first thing that needs to be done is uh, environmental license. So the, that's Swan Valley West responsibility. They will have to get the environmental approval for the project that they move forward with, then pre-design, de detailed design, and, and away they go. So that, that process alone could take one of those one year to four years uh, uh, because of the scope of the project. Again, depending on, on what road is taken, uh, it would be Swan Valley West as the larger, larger project. I'm guessing it would be the, the principal owner. Uh, we would have an agreement for our portion of the project, maybe a phase construction possibly would be recommended. Uh, if it does go solely on our ditch, I'm sure we can work out a, a quick agreement with the Swan Valley West and the province to cost share. And how we would be paying, uh, we, I guess we, I just haven't had that, those detailed conversations. We haven't really done a detailed estimate of what this cost would be yet. So we've been very preliminary talks with the Swan Valley West and the MLA and we'll check for uh, cost share. That's it. Mm -hmm. Councillor Gray. Um, I've lost time. And Councillor Glory asked some of the questions. The plan is that we would pay a third of the share of the project that is within our municipality. Is that it? Uh, that's what we would hope for, yeah. Well, that would be, I would be unimpressed if we did more. 
Um, do we know any idea what that would be? Uh, off, off, there's four culverts. I played like off the top of my head. The whole project and our extents would be between seventy and ninety thousand dollars. Because how would we know whether we're supportive until we know what it's going to cost us and how we're going to pay for it? Yeah, that's my question. Uh, the third, second thing is, why is this something that Swan, uh, Swan Valley Watershed isn't a partner of? That's why we I mean, we we they've got they've gotten we've contributed um, or what's been spent in matters that affect or approve or improve or help the town is approximately what we put in. They've gotten three times that value from the province and we've got no value. I, I don't understand why watershed, given that well, this is in fact a watershed issue, why they wouldn't be involved and why uh, our share particularly wouldn't be covered by Swan Valley Watershed. The Conservation District did look at this project. They were approached years ago by Swan Valley West and from, from what uh, I have last heard that they were in favor of the rerouting of the stream. I, I have no doubt they're in favor of it. What I'm asking is what will they pay for? Yeah, and, and, and MIT also, I, I apologize to Council, I did say that I would email the minutes to them, I never got around to doing that, but uh, in the conversations during our meeting, uh, MIT would not be specific on what they would and would not pay for. But everything is on the table, including you know a very large chunk of that that construction cost to to a sizable cost share. They they really were not, were unable to say what they would contribute at that during that conversation. Uh, I think it was just to try to get the everyone in the in the discussion that uh, MIT is strongly recommending that uh, they they build a new natural stream to where it wants to on the on the point on the watershed I I know it has been discussed there but I will bring it up in again and I will, I'll make a special point to go talk with the uh, technician and, and I, yeah I don't care whether they pay the whole project I just care that they pay our project since we keep contri over contributing and not getting value anyway, Councilor White oh there's a third point Okay, you're still on. Thank you. I don't know how you got on. <laughs> how I got on? <clears throat> he was talking, and then you started. <laughs> Let's, that, we won't argue about that, <laughs> Councillor Gray. Okay. Uh, lastly, was there a discussion in there about an indemnity? We have another municipality that's sending water through our municipality, and if for some reason that happens to overflow or cause problem, Presumably, that municipality is going to indemnify us. We're not going to be responsible for that, I presume, and our homeowners are going to be responsible. Those discussions we're not having. Okay, but that's, uh, for me, I'm supportive if we pay no more than a third share of the part of our municipality, if watershed is approached and contributes it, and if we have an indemnity, so we're not responsible. The idea of taking somebody else's water, putting it through our municipality, and we would potentially be responsible for the homeowners to back up on them, is not palatable. Okay. I mean, we need permission to, or we want to talk to the people that are impacted to make sure that they um, agree. To the that's all part of the process. Yeah, no, no, that's the environmental process. I know, but good points. You're I'm sorry, Councillor White. Councillor White. Thank you. I'm not sure saying we paid no more than a third share is something I would want in a contract until I knew what the cost was. If it's twenty million dollars, we want to, we don't want to, if it's twenty one million, we want to put seven million in there. So we should know what the cost is before we decide what proportion. And I'm not sure what you meant by that we have received nothing from unless you're talking specifically to this issue, because the water stewardship board, whatever they're called, conservation district, put a lot of money into bank stabilization done by the cemetery all through that area. So they did put money and did they get more? Absolutely. But we didn't have to pay as much as it would have cost because uh, they did do things for us. Councilor Gray. I, I, I either misspoke or, or was unclear or you didn't hear me clearly, one of the three. We have contributed a certain amount of money to the Swan Valley Watershed District, it's wonderful watershed district. What has been paid for including that project is just about, actually just a little less, but it's just about what we've contributed 
Those contributions were matched by three times the grant from the province. Those monies were spent in other municipalities, not ours. That's what I said. I, I didn't say we got nothing ever. What I did say is we, we would have gotten, we spent exactly what they spent. It was of no value to us up to this point. Yeah, and, and I understood that. Um, I wonder if there's an issue with, um, with the watershed being able to put money into this if the province is looking at a third share too. And then so you have another provincial body, so to speak, receiving granting going into this and maybe that's the reason why they turn that down? Uh, I don't, you know what, I don't know. I never had those discussions with, with the MLA. I know that, uh, as my report says, he intends on, on, ask, on ask, yeah. using his political power to ask the question, does it have to go north of 75, can it go south? And that's the reason for this resolution. And, and I spoke with the MLA last week about this, and he's he has been uh, pushing some buttons in, at the ledge. So we'll see where that goes. <clears throat> Any further discussion? All in favor? Opposed? That's carried. Not 8.4. Resolve the town of Swanover support the joint Manitoba 150 banner installation project with the Manitoba Maine Federation. Through the Northwest uh, Métis Council, moved by Councilor Morio, seconded by Councilor White. Discussion? Councilor Morio? Uh, I think this is another um, significant opportunity for us to show our appreciation to uh, an individual that uh, was a leader of his time back then, but also to the Northwest Métis Council that is uh, um, filling in a gap um, that's uh, left by are to us, the federal and provincial governments, to a, a group of people, and as a way of recognizing it and showing that uh, our appreciation um, um, to support their organizations, especially for um, the significant amount of investments that they have already made and are looking to put in our community. So, um, I think they're going to be a valuable uh, partner to us going forward in the investment um, in our economy. So. Um, if this goes to improving and making those uh, relationships, it's, it's a great thing. Uh, on Sunday, uh, President uh, Chartrand on his uh, daily address uh, to the membership that's on uh, Facebook and that, uh, recognized that there's only three municipalities in the province that have uh, agreed to support this project. And one was the city of Selkirk, the city of Dauphin, and the town of Swan River, the only municipalities at this point that we have agreed to come on board and put these banners up in the community. So okay. um, I think it's a good idea. Okay. Any further discussion? Um, Councillor Gray? Go ahead, Councillor Gray. Everybody understands why July 14th is such an important day, right? <coughs> they, they became the province. Mm -hmm. Okay. Call, uh, Deputy Mayor um, I, I agree in supporting is supporting the request looking at the information that we provided in, in along to, to go along with that on page one just in regards to the um, high school um, brackets and the cost that we had for that that we assumed was or that is three thousand dollars assuming that they're the school division is going to pay the fifty percent and that was the idea of tossed around about printing another side of the banner I think I would put a, um, a proposal in that we cover the entire cost of those brackets. Those brackets are going to be used on an annual or on an annual basis to replace uh, the Northwest Roundup signs that we have, the Town of Swan River signs. So they will be used again um, for other flag or other banners that we have. So I would move that we cover that entire cost. We, we, we're, we're sorry, but this is a, a resolution that. We're discussing on you can't make another resolution or a motion while we're debating uh, a resolution. Okay, sorry. Uh, that was that was all I had. Okay. If if you want to make an amendment to it, then perhaps you can. But it's fine. Are you sure? Yeah. Okay. Good. Further discussion. Okay. All in favor? Opposed? Abstention. Yes, okay. <clears throat> Did you take that down, Mr. Crow?
9.1. <clears throat> Resolved that the amended 2020 fee schedule be approved. Moved by Councilor Gray, second by Deputy Mayor Montoni. Discussion? Councilor Gray. The only thing when we talk about the fee schedule, I'm incredibly happy with the way we've expanded the end of that piece. The amendment on closures, I thought we had in there the cost of the land was independent of the fee. The fee was the fee, and then the cost of the land was a separate, distinct item that people were buying. <coughs> is that not true? Yeah, that was the Okay, so yeah. cost of land is is separate, and a separate term. Okay, good, we're good. Okay, I did, I did. further discussion? All in favor? Opposed? It's carried. Ten point one resulted the draft audited fine and federal gas tax funding annual expenditure report for the year ended December thirty first, two thousand nineteen be approved. Moved by Deputy Mayor Wintoni, seconded by <clears throat> Councillor Delorier. Discussion? All in favor? Opposed? That's carried. Ten point two. Resolved that the accounts as follows be hereby approved for payment. General accounts check number 26234 to 26263 for a total of 98,562.39. Payroll accounts checks number 4676 to 4682 for a total of 96,438.48. Moved by Councilor Morio, seconded by Deputy Mayor Antoni. Discussion? Questions? All in favor? Opposed? It's carried. 10.3 Resolved that the financial statements for the five months ending May 31st, 2020 be adopted as received. Moved by <clears throat> Deputy Mayor Antoni, seconded by Councillor Gray. Discussion? Councillor Gray? Um, as I'm reading this, um, it, it's a little confusing, but I just want to make sure. Are we, we're not projecting a deficit, even though it shows right now a deficit. It, the reason we're not projecting a deficit is because we've got no tax revenue yet, and we're just behind. Our revenues are, are, are slower than our expenditures. Is that correct? Okay, I just want to make sure that was true, that I wasn't misreading it. Um, okay, that's connected to the deficit. The general government um, spent expenditures appear to me to be on pace for a deficit. Is that right? Uh, I would have to talk to Terry about that, but I okay. cannot see that. Okay. It, it, it's close, but it looks to me like we're a little overextended. I'm just trying to figure out why and if it's going to be, if there's something we're going to come back. Um, I suppose I can cover recreation at a different point. I just know for um, <coughs> this uh, purpose, I've got something here, I don't understand what I've got, but the protect, protective services amount seems unduly low because we don't appear to have a protective <coughs> amount for the RCMP yet. The protect, oh, I'm sorry, protective services budget or uh, expenditures seem unduly low because we, we don't appear to have included any of our, our policing expenditures yet. No. Uh, I don't think I don't think we've got the invoice. The invoice right. just came in two weeks ago. We okay. asked that last meeting, so it yeah. didn't show up in the main. Okay, I just <laughs> uh, we're doing. Oh yes, when we do it, okay, that that was my other thing. We do all this on a cash basis, so we don't. Um, there's no approval. Okay. Further discussion. All in favor? Opposed? It's carried. <clears throat> Ten three one. Whereas the town of Swan River used municipal equipment, materials, and labor to carry out private works on private property under the Municipal Act, uh, Clause 252E, and set the fees and charges for the works under Clause 252-1A of the Act. And whereas sufficient time has been allowed for payment of such outstanding amounts as listed below, therefore be it resolved that each of the following unpaid amounts be added to the corresponding uh, property to tax roll and collected in the manner under subsections 252.2 of the Act. <clears throat> Invoice 15603, July 24, 2019, $470.03 was replaced water meter. Replaced water meter. Charges were 5880. Total 52 528 and 83 cents. 
tax rule 002130013000127000001 September 30th 2018 6171 utility charges were 308 total 6479 tax rule 0021300.000127500 December 31st, 2018, 6171 utility, dollar 54 in charges, 6325 total, tax roll 0021300.000, July 9th, 2019, $9.18 utility, uh, no charges total, $9.18, 0021300, Total amount six hundred two dollars and sixty three cents. Charges total sixty three forty two. Total of six hundred and sixty six and five cents. Be it further resolved that the notice be sent to the property owner detailing the amounts being added to the taxes and advising that the interest will accrue on said amounts in the same manner as for unpaid property taxes effective July first, two thousand and twenty. Moved by Councillor Gray, seconded by Deputy Mayor Wintoni. Discussion. All in favor? It's carried. 11.1. Result of the Town of Swan River bylaw number 12, 2020, being a bylaw to establish a reserve fund for the replacement of rental tables and chairs to be read a second time. Moved by Councilor Morial, second by Deputy Mayor and Tony. Discussion? All in favor? It's carried. Eleven two, resolved by law ten two thousand and twenty, being the bylaw of the town of Swan River to regulate building, being read a first time. Moved by Councillor De Morio, seconded by. I need a seconder. Councillor Gray, all in favor? Or sorry, discussion. Councillor Gray. Uh, I assume that this is going to go back to a committee of the whole, and we may in fact have a public hearing on this, given the facts, um, construction in the entire town. We can talk about that at the committee before we come to second reading. Yeah. Okay. Councilor Moran. Um, Councilor Gray is exactly right, but just to highlight the change, it was just two schedules amalgamated yeah. to one that were basically. So, um, I, I, there's a couple of, uh, one of the things that I do want to talk about before we get forward is the dollar amounts because it's not been changed for a long time and $5,000 is a lot more years ago. Okay. Further discussion? All in favor? It's carried. 11-3. Resolved that bylaw number 13, 2020, being a bylaw of the town of Swanover, to close a public reserve, be read at first time. Moved by... But before it's moved, I have to declare an interest in 11.3, and at this time, I will excuse myself from the conversation. Okay, somebody will come and get you. Noted that Deputy Mayor Wintoni has left the meeting. Moved by Councillor Morio, seconded by Councillor Gray. <clears throat> Open up for discussion. Councillor Gray. Uh, again, I assume this is the kind of thing where we're getting notice to all the adjacent landowners within a period of space. And since the plan is for transfer at some point, I presume particularly with respect to the adjacent properties, that they're going to be given notice that that's a contention. So if they want to make an application for it, they can. Because um, I think it would be dangerous for us to go ahead without telling people they have the right to do the same thing. If, if this resolution is passed, then it moves to the next step, yeah. which is the public uh, hearing where all those property owners will be notified, correct? They're notified of this application. Uh, Councilor Gray is talking about a, a notice prior to that saying, if you wish to do, like, am I correct? If you yeah. wish to do the same, you're free to do so. The point is that, that there, other adjacent owners may never have turned their attention to it. And I, I, I would, given the, the, the particular circumstances here, I think people need to be given an opportunity to consider what they're doing. There, in most of our cases, this isn't the case. Most of our public preserve lands are encroachments and so on. Um, are like Ross Street, who, like I'm not buying something 
across <coughs> somebody else's property across the street. Uh, there would be nobody else who would buy it except for the property owner. But this is one where there are several adjacent properties, all of whom might have an interest in it, particularly one who, who abuts it completely on the other side. And, and I think we should be cautious to make sure that they're aware, not just that the application is being done, but that they have an equal right to participate. My, my question, I guess, to, to Mr. Kroll or to Mr. Poole on that, you heard what he just said, Councillor Gray said. So my question would be is, if there's an application to go through this process right now by one individual, then that process goes through. There is no no opportunity for another property owner to say, hey, I would like to do this because there's already a person that's kind of, there's no bidding, so to speak, right? No, it's, uh, the, the property hasn't been opened up for bidding or sale. It's really someone in their own interest has looked to the property and said, I'd like to approach the town and purchase that, which is a perfectly normal thing to do. So um, the, the process that you're, you're asking for is not usual. I don't know that it's illegal or anything, but I, I just, um, given the unique sit back situation here, I, I'm, I'm uncomfortable without there being some ability of others to do it. But we can go through the first reading, because that doesn't hurt anything. We can go to the public hearing, and we can then voice our concerns at that point. Uh, I'll let Mr. Poole answer that and then Councillor Delorier. Uh, just a comment for Council that the, the current applicant uh, has has paid his fee and if this gets, does get turned down, he gets a full reimbursement of that fee. Any further applicants, we just got past the fee schedule that there's a mandatory $500 non-refundable amount uh, uh, for any further applications. I just wanted to make that clear. Councillor Gloria. So, just so I'm clear on the process, so a member, uh, uh, a citizen applies to take the land out of public reserve, but but and then let's say that he has no guarantee that we're going that the land is then going to be sold, though, does he? No. No. So so you you could spend four grand taking out of public reserve and still not be able to buy it. That's correct. The municipal board will actually. If there's, if there's a lot of public objections to this, or if they just deem this to be inappropriate, they may stop it themselves outside of council's wishes, and, and it will stop. No, but I guess what I'm saying is the process actually goes to completion where it's not public reserve anymore, it's just regular bare land that the town owns. The applicant still has no guarantee that he's going to be able to buy that land, right? That's correct. This, this application is just to take it out of public reserve, then it will become zone OR, and council can sell and do the land transfer, and at that point they can deny it as well. There's several points that council can deny this transaction. Yeah, in, and, and this time. is the reason why of that $500 charge, because administration spends a lot of time dealing with these applications. No, I guess what I'm going for, not necessarily with this particular instance, but but uh, in any case, there's no there's no link to from being the applicant to take it out of public reserve to even having you know, first right of refusal or any, you, you have no, nothing to tie you to that and that seems kind of unfair, unfair to me. Yeah. Like, the, we, we, I think our process needs to be improved as far as it needs to be uh, tied to, to an agreement of sale or something like that. Like, like cause you, you know, he, you, anybody, you know, you could put a lot of, you put a lot of risk out and there's no, so I think we do need to look at our process yeah, I mean, it's too late now for this application. The process is what it is. Mr. Crow. The process is laid down by the province, though. Yeah. We're just we're following the steps exactly what the yeah, process says we're supposed to follow. So yeah. That's correct. Um, did you have a question? Yeah, just a comment. The next step now is you to get the survey done and get it subdivided, so there's a substantial cost to that. That's what our next step is before the public hearing. Okay. And in my opinion, I think that risk is entirely appropriate. When you design a subdivision, there, there is a, a percentage of the land that must, that must be given to public reserve. This is, uh, this is pretty unorthodox. Uh, you know, this isn't usual. We should, not be, we should not be chunking up our public reserve and selling it off. There's, there's places where it makes sense, like the previous ones, Fishers, accesses that we don't need anymore, even Ross Street. Uh, that we're just, we're just, we know we're not going to use those. Maybe it's, it's not of no value to us. Uh, but a, a green space in the center of a residential area 
it, it's just my opinion, but I believe that risk is appropriate. And, and Councilor Gray? I'm sorry. The property is all behind 22, 2018, and 11, 9. Is that also green space? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Just, I'm, not, I'm not just familiar with it, so. Okay. So if this is approved, this will just take it to the next step. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. So further discussion? Okay. All in favor? Opposed? Councilor Gray? Just, I, I'm in favor for first reading. Okay. It's carried. You can have uh, Deputy Mayor Tony come back then. Please. Resolve that pursuance to sections 152 3 of the Municipal Act Council go into committee and close the meeting to the public. Uh, discuss legal matters and employee relations. Moved by Councillor Grace and by Councillor Morio. All in favor? Opposed? It's carried. We are now in.